every library is proud to launch a new crowdfunding platform, fundlibraries.org, to help libraries connect with donors and their communities more effectively. It's part of our commitment to help librarians succeed. Whether that's on a project in the largest classroom in their school or their community library, please visit funlibraries.org today and donate to support amazing library and literacy projects. Everyone can make a difference. Find out more today at funlibraries.org. Hi, everybody. This is John Krask, Executive Director of Every Library and the Every Library Institute. I'm very pleased today to be with uh, Alan Greenblatt, uh, Senior Writer for Governing Magazine, for a conversation around the, the, uh, the current state of play for funding for states and municipalities in education, what's happening in Congress, what's happening in the uh, state legislators, and his insights uh, into municipal funding and municipalities. Um, Alan is a senior staff writer for Governing Magazine. He's co-author of Governing States and Localities, which is a standard textbook on state and local governments. He previously has worked uh, as a reporter for NPR and Congressional Quarterly, where he won the National Press Club's Sandy Hume Award for political journalism. At Governing Magazine, Alan uh, covers many issues of concern to state and local governments, including budgets, taxes, and education. Alan, thank you for being here today. What the heck is going on in Congress? What's happening in the world today? I mean, you, you were very current on your, on your coverage. What keeps you up at night right now when you think about the state of, of affairs for funding for municipalities and for states? Um, well, I think what keeps me up at night is more the coronavirus, personally. I don't, I'm not super reliant on funding, um, but it is a big problem. And I think, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get into this, but states, cities, and counties between them are facing revenue shortfalls of roughly a trillion dollars um, over the next couple of years. Um, and at the same time, as is usual during a recession or downturn, their expenses are going up for things like Medicaid and unemployment. So there's a big, big squeeze on. Um, and there was sort of an assumption going into the recession, you know, when things shut down in March, Congress had a big um, package called the CARES Act, which did include about $150 billion for, for states in some localities. Um, large localities. Um, yeah, and there was sort of an assumption that was going to be a down payment that in previous downturns, Congress has, you know, with its borrowing power with no balanced budget um, requirement, which almost every state has in most localities, um, that, that the feds would come up with a considerable package for, for states uh, and local governments. Uh, which has happened in previous recessions, certainly in the so-called Great Recession of 2007-09. Um, yeah, and that has just stalled out. Um, uh, we're talking about a week before people will watch this, so we don't know, but it's been many months now where there's been no activity on this. The House, which is, of course, led by the Democrats, passed a big package, the HEALS Act, that included a trillion um, dollars for subnational governance, as we say. Um, but of course, that's gone nowhere in the Senate, which is Republican controlled, and the Republicans have been very wary about giving aid to state and localities. So uh, probably in the end, there will be some money, um, but it's not looking great for making up the size of the hole, for plugging the size of the hole that states, cities, and counties face at this point. Yeah, it's interesting because we're, we're, we are recording on the 8th of September right now. So we're, we're six days out from the beginning of the conference and a lot can happen in, in the meantime. But the differences between those two Senate and, and, and House proposals is very significant. What happens in the meantime, though, is threats to employment. And I look at what um, uh, Joseph Stieglitz and, and Kitty Richards wrote about in the New York Times this past weekend about um, the unemployment furloughs, layoffs to state and, and municipal government as being a multiplier effect. We're, we're an advocacy organization for public employees when you get right down to it. Public library, school library, academic library. There's plenty of private in there too, don't get me wrong, but in the main. Uh, what they said though in the New York Times was that, um, it says here, for each dollar of spending that state cuts leads to a drop of at least $1.50 in GDP. And they say it may, might be as high as $2.50 in local GDP. And that's just, not, that's not just employment, that's all the other spending that states do, cities, towns, counties, municipalities. Um, in the Great Recession, there was 
sort of a, a spike in, in federal support and then it diminished over time. If we don't see a spike or some sustained support, I mean, what's your prognostications here about the effect on GDP because of, of um, the inability for states and municipalities to spend properly? Yeah, so uh, unemployment at the state and local level is a big deal already. Uh, more jobs have been lost than happened during the Great Recession. Um, yeah, and there may be more to come. I mean, there's a little bit of an uptick in August, um, mainly with uh, some temporary uh, layoff, uh, people going back to work for schools, essentially mm -hmm. what happened. But, you know, overall, we're still talking about a million fewer people working for local governments than were working back in February. So that's big and it, you know, there could be more. Um, you know, one of the lessons of the Great Recession, you say lessons as though it was learned, what, what seems not to have been remembered was the effect on the overall economy because there was a lot of money for states and localities um, in the 2009 stimulus package that passed, you know, roughly a month after Obama, and I guess I should say Obama and Biden took office. Um, but there was, you talked about it was diminished over time, but it was actually, they called it the fiscal cliff, like the money just went away. Like there was, it got them through a year or two. And so you had uh, states um, and, and the rest facing budget problems for some years after. I mean, by the start of this year, I think it was something like 45 states were back to the level of revenue that they had in 2007 mm -hmm. it took many of them years to get there so there were you know significant cuts particularly in higher ed but you know in all kinds of uh programs and it, there is this multiplier effect i mean the, there are different numbers out there but they you know generally the number that i see most often is that for every dollar that the federal government would spend to the send to the states that would create a dollar thirty in economic activity. Mm -hmm. uh, so, because the states will then, you know, pay people to pave the roads and et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, there, there's, there are when, when, when they spend money, they're not only paying their own employees, but they spend money on other things like you know any other enterprise does. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we had that long period of recovery after two thousand nine, where it was sort of you know. I think the Washington Post called it a recovery only an economist could love, where you know people still felt like, when is the recovery going to happen? And of course, you know, so much of the economic activity after the Great Recession, between the two recessions, I guess we could say now, was really concentrated in about 20 large cities: Seattle, San Francisco, Denver, Austin, Boston, New York, DC, and and some others. So a lot of the country never felt like there was a recovery, and there were other effects, but a lot of it was you know, there's state and local spending in every corner of the country. And a lot of it just never, never quite recovered. And so that was a drag on the economy as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not just a problem for, for governments and government employees, but, but for, you know, economic lift off. You know, when I think about the, um, the, the approach that government sometimes takes, whether it's a city council or a state legislature or, or Congress, um, in a crisis, there's a tendency to cut, 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 you know, and, and that sets up a situation where um, you have an austerity budget. You know, we've seen it in the UK play out, you know, for years about what an austerity budget does. We saw it in a certain respect after the Great Recession when that fiscal cliff happened because there was no willingness to raise revenue. And with the 2017 tax bill that went through uh, under the Trump administration, is well, even going further back, sequestration is essentially an austerity environment. And the 2017 budget uh, tax bill reconnoitered the way that, that the whole system works. Do you see it's possible right now, Alan, for this country to raise revenue and not just do spending cuts? Or is it going to just rely on borrowing uh, up until it runs out of sort of political will? Like, what's your estimation? Well, um, so if you're talking at the federal level, I mean, there's going to be more borrowing. Like we were at a trillion dollar deficit, uh, annual deficit, heading into this recession. Mm -hmm. And now we have a, a, a federal debt that's the size of the economy for the first time since World War II. Mm -hmm. So, and we see that there is this um, fear of, of debt and deficits, which is the reason why there has not been a, a, another substantial aid package from from Congress, you know, for 
six months now, almost six months, um, there's a reluctance to keep borrowing. And, you know, this national debt is sizable. Um, uh, <clears throat> and then at the state and local level, it's not as big of an option. You know, during, during the years following the Great Recession, there what well, during the Great Recession after, there was a reluctance to raise taxes, much more so than in the recession of 2001. Uh, that just politically the will wasn't there or was thought to be a bad idea or harmful to an economy already on the ropes. Um, and so there were increases in fines and fees mm -hmm. and things like that. But in terms of broad-based taxes, you know, of course, there were some increases in sales taxes. California, perhaps most notably, uh, had an increase in income taxes that was supposed to be a temporary fix. And then Jerry Brown, as governor, convinced voters to extend it and you know a decade ago we were talking about california as the next greece with a whatever 35 billion dollar deficit um and they they got their fiscal house in order seemingly um with a tax increase uh and jerry brown even though he's a democrat he did hold the line on a lot of spending increases that legislators wanted so california i forget the number now but they went enter this year with a surplus of something like nine or 12 billion dollars and then you know almost immediately faced the shortfall of uh 54 billion dollars and you know it should be noted what part of the rhetoric in washington is that states have been sloppy they have a good haven't been good managers of their money um why should we bail out states like illinois uh and new jersey um sometimes noted as democratic led uh when other states like Florida uh, uh, allegedly <laughs> had better fiscal management. So the reality is that states in general, you know, there's certainly, you know, Kentucky, uh, Illinois, New Jersey, they all perennially underfund their pension systems. You can find fault with, with some of their budget practices for sure. But in general, states went into this crisis in pretty good shape uh, with roughly $80 billion in their rainy day funds, which was more money and a higher percentage of their general fund budgets than had been the case going into the 2007-09 recession. Um, so they had been prudent and they, you know, they were able to use that money to plug holes. You know, the, the most states, the fiscal year starts on July 1st. So the, the ceiling caved in in mid-March. So they really only had a couple of months of, of suddenly declining revenue and they were able to get through the last fiscal year with combination rainy day funds and modest cuts and modest uh, fee increases, tax increases. So the issue now is this year that they're in, um, a lot of them, it's just sort of like Wiley e. Coyote, they went running off the cliff thinking there might still be ground. Mm -hmm. They can find a spot of ground to land on maybe. Um, you know, California most directly bet on the federal government's coming through with some money in the end. Uh, their budget includes $12 billion worth of cuts that will take place if there is no congressional action by the middle of next month. Mm -hmm. You know, they assume there would be a federal bailout or federal relief, whatever term you prefer to use. Mm -hmm. uh, but if it doesn't happen, those cuts become automatic. And there are other states where they sort of withheld payments to schools that weren't quite due yet, or this kind of thing, but they'll really be scrambling There'll be a lot of special sessions in the fall with states coming back and chopping their budgets because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they managed to pass a budget for the year and they thought, well, we could get a couple of months in and then by then Congress will give us some money. So that hasn't happened yet. So that's the big, that's the big uh, problem that they face right now. You know, I, I look at the stock market for my 401k, you know, as a, as a, you know, investor, I guess, though it's not very big. I, I look at uh, unemployment figures because I've been told over the years those matter, um, though unemployment's got a lot of hidden unemployment issues in it. But the thing that I've learned over the last couple of years working in the public sector in support of, of libraries is to look at the way tax revenues are being collected, the pace that they're being collected in. You know, what I'm worried about for 2020, 2021, you touched on already, is when's the other shoe going to fall? You know, We've got some kinds of taxes that are lagging indicators um, and other taxes that are more consumption-based. I mean, where are you paying attention right now um, to the whole cloth for revenue for those states, as, you, as you've been describing? 
So this is a unique uh, recession where almost every tax you can name fell through the floor. Mm -hmm. Sales taxes, of course, took an immediate hit. Um, and uh, gas taxes certainly took an immediate hit. Hotel taxes have dwindled mm -hmm. precipitately, um, et cetera. So then, you know, for the other big ones, income taxes are going to be a problem. So I jotted down a number. Uh, personal income taxes, the last number that we sort of have, you know, national, national data for state tax revenue collection is June. So it's a couple of months old already. But um, compared to last June, personal income tax collections were down 18%. Uh, corporate income tax collections down 37%. So corporate income taxes are a much smaller share of the budgets, but that's obviously a huge drop. Uh, the thing is, the income taxes you know, we'll see what they look like next year. I mean, most people don't pay quarterly. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing how they went down month to month. It doesn't tell us as much as what, we, what we'll see next year. Next April will be key um, uh, for, for states. And then for property taxes, those tend to be more stable. And obviously for counties in particular, they're the main source of, of revenue. Um, people's houses, even in a well-run county, are only reassessed every three years, and often it takes 20 years. So it won't get reflected right away. Uh, at the, you know, we'll see what happens with the real estate market. You know, this has been kind of a poor person's recession in the end. Uh, there are people who are able to work office jobs remotely so far have been pretty well insulated, not entirely, but pretty well. Um, so, you know, for income taxes, it may not be as dire as I would have predicted at the start, but, you know, at the longer this goes on, you know, we're seeing greater unemployment in more sectors. So that could be a real problem. And then the housing market so far is holding up great. Uh, sales are great. Uh, you know, there are, <laughs> there are a lot of people looking for more space right now, in part because they're working from home. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we don't know what the picture will be with property taxes, uh, but you know we'll see. The the I'm sure you've seen the estimates. Up to 40 million people were facing eviction this year, so that's been put on hold. Basically, there still are some evictions happening, but you know with the CDC order, people are going to be able to stay in their rental places until December 31st, and then we'll see what happens at that point. And there is kind of a bipartisan interest. We've seen policy at the state level to keep people, you know, to keep moratoriums on evictions going. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, that, that obviously, at some point, those bills come due. Those people are going to owe eight months of back rent instead of four months of back rent and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, their landlords have mortgage payments. So anyway, property taxes in the end could be a real problem. But that's a lot of information, but the, the term you used is key because um, leading indicators and lagging indicators, um, you know, some things happen right away and some things take a while to take effect. So if you go back to the last recession, tax collections at the state and local level were a lagging indicator. The economy took a hit. We had the financial crisis, you know, the housing market bubble burst and then the financial crisis in the fall of 2008. Anyway, and, it took a couple of years for state revenues to sort of really hit the skids. And again, they did get help from the feds back then, but it takes a while because, you know, money you earn in January of 2020, you may not pay your full tax on until April of 2021. So, I mean, you can just see with that as an example, how long right. it can take for, for that to show up. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we're still, we still haven't, we still don't know what the end of the coronavirus crisis looks like or when it will happen, um, but there will be still some fallout for state and local budgets, even after we're sort of through the worst of the public health crisis and yeah. the economic crisis. Yeah, the, uh, the, the, the old adage about, you know, the, the big city, you know, gets the sniffles, the suburbs catch a cold, you know. Um, I look at that, the state of play for funding for municipalities and for, and, pu and for public libraries in a similar kind of way, or for, for education spending and then the programs for 
school libraries or academic libraries inside the, those wrappers. You, you said something I want, I want to pivot to a little bit though. You said just a toss off comment about a, in a functioning county, it's every three years and sometimes it's 20 years. You know, the, I, want, I want to pivot just a minute to, to the idea of functioning government. Um, you wrote the other day that uh, leaders in states and localities have failed to convince their colleagues in Washington that they represent not just a good, but a necessary investment. And then you also talk about uh, the tension between state legislators and governors. Um, and there's like, how do we break through some of the dysfunctions as citizens, as stakeholders, and as leaders in our, in our small units of government for, for libraries as parts of municipalities, like for this to work properly um, and for us to, not, to have a softer landing I mean, why is there such a disconnect between that necessary and proper role of government as, as you see it? Well, there's so many questions in that question. Yeah. Um, uh, so, you know, one thing I've been thinking about a lot is that the normal people never think about federalism. Um, and they don't think about our system of government. You know, when, you, when you're in school, you learn about checks and balances because there's a judiciary and a legislative and an executive. Um, and you sort of forget for the founders, states were also a check on central authority. Mm -hmm. um, and so without getting too deep into that, I mean, there is this real hostility now between states and federal government on a partisan basis. Uh, you might even say the resistance has moved out of Congress and into the states. So, you know, it was shocking during the Obama presidency when Republican attorneys general sued him repeatedly over environmental protections and the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and it used to be like going back to the Reagan era, having two or more states band together to sue the federal government was really rare, like once or twice a year it happened. And by Obama's time, at the end of his presidency, it was a dozen times a year. And that seemed like a shockingly high number. And of course, he had individual attorneys general suing as well. Uh, but under Trump, his first year in office, there were 36 of these multiple state lawsuits against the federal government. And another 50 since then, and the attorneys general in California, Massachusetts, New York, Washington State, they've all sued 50, 70 times each. And you can name the policy, whether it's uh, migrant children, um, the Muslim ban, uh, the census citizenship question, on and on. Uh, Every, at every turn, there's been a democratic policy response in the forms of states suing the federal government. Mm -hmm. So there is this hostility between the feds and the states. Uh, we saw this earlier in the pandemic when Trump said, it's not up to us to distribute the national stockpile. We're not shipping clerks. Uh, governors have to get their own ventilators and we're there to backstop, you know, which was a different sense of the federal response mm -hmm. than previous presidents had had, but it was spoke to that mindset. And, he, and the rhetoric that he and other Republicans use all the time talking about Democrat-run cities, Democrat-run states, his desire to withhold funding, federal funding from New York and Seattle and Portland and other, uh, what did he call it, anarchist jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. um, there's not the sense that we're all in this part of the same country. And, you know, obviously that cuts both ways. And, you know, the biggest divide in our, well, one of the biggest divides in our in our um, in our country right now is the part is is a geographic divide. So the Democrats get almost all their votes from major cities in college towns, and they're uh, eating into the Republicans um, some of the strongholds in affluent suburbs. And then the Republicans control everything else, all the small towns, the rural towns, and so forth. So certainly, you know, covering states, this plays out all the time where. Uh, this, the, the cities are all run by Democrats and often very liberal Democrats, you know, and that's all over the place, Birmingham, Salt Lake. I mean, it's not just the coastal cities, but all over. Mm -hmm. Almost every city is dominated by Democrats, and most of the states are still controlled by Republicans, despite some Democratic gains in 2018. So you have states, as a matter of course, preempting local government on, you know, some high-profile things like plastic bag bans and minimum wage increases, but really on almost everything. Uh, uh, the, 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 the limitations on the size of signs, things like that. I mean, it's become habit reflex for states to preempt cities. Mm -hmm. I think this mindset is a little bit coming into our national politics. 
um, where, like I say, there's this antagonism between parts of the country, and we don't see ourselves as all one polity. Mm -hmm. you, you wrote at one point that Americans, America's governments are at war with each other. And Alan, that, that brought me up short, because I think that, that there's a lot of truth to that. Um, and it, it, it does seem driven by a, a similar ideology and a similar uh, need for more turf that, that wars are, are, are done. Um, we are you know, talking a lot about Congress, and that seems kind of big, and states, which is in a certain respect you know, kind of abstract. What I want to drill down to for a minute or two is the localities, you know, cities and counties. You wrote recently about um, three cities. You said they're thriving despite the pandemic. Um, and each city, you said, boasts a particular set of characteristics, and, and one of them is anchor institutions. And we, in the library land, look at libraries, of course, as an anchor institution. But I don't recall you talking about libraries in particular. You were talking about industry and hospitals and other ways to generate um, economic growth. Can you dive into why you identified those towns, those, those particular cities, as being more functional during this crisis than perhaps the other parts of government that are at war with each other? Are they, are they, are they more functional in spite of the fact that they're, they're state governments uh, behaving in a particular way, or, or is it... Are they aligned? Like, what's, what's the secret sauce there? Well, so that story was really about their economic performance and not mm -hmm. necessarily their governmental performance. Yeah. Um, so the three, they were all cities of about 60,000 residents. So there are 389 metropolitan areas in the country. In 388 of them, the unemployment rate is higher than it was a year ago. Mm -hmm. So the one exception is Owensboro, Kentucky. So, of course, that was one of my three. And then the other two are Logan, Utah, and Idaho Falls, Idaho, which both have unemployment of about 3.5%. Mm -hmm. And so I was just looking at, you know, what made them so darn special. Uh, and, you know, it just turned out they, they were lucky, basically, uh, that they had the right mix of industries for our pandemic uh, economy. So they each had a big hospital, the one in Owensboro, something like 4,000 employees, and they decided not to lay off anybody, the hospital did. You know, even as lots of hospitals were laying people off in the spring, since people were not coming in for elective um, procedures. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they also, you know, Owensboro, they make ragu, they make uh, P.F. Chang's frozen foods. I mean, each of them had some industry that was doing well in this moment. I mean, there's certain things that are doing great right now. I mean, we're at the end of summer. Um, gosh, I wish I'd bought stock in Dick's Sporting Goods because, um, you know, all people can do is be, be outdoors. Um, and that's their entertainment. So good luck buying a kayak right now or a bicycle. Um, anyway, so those places were lucky, but in a the sense, they, you know, it's the old saying, the harder you work, the luckier you get. I mean, they all had worked for years, kind of laid the groundwork. One of the big things was that they diversified their economy. Um, they didn't have the one plant that when it shut down caused mass unemployment, which by the way, um, I wrote recently about college towns. Um, and we all thought college towns were recession proof, but it turned out that they were just another form of company town. And if the college doesn't reopen, then, uh, then, you know, then they, their, all their tax base uh, falls through the floor as yeah. well. They do reopen when they get COVID. Um, but anyway, I mean, uh, yeah, it, uh, little, small, small cities that thrive in my experience, you know, not that I'm an economic consultant or anything, but it, I see this story play out time and again. There's always cooperation on the local level. It's, they, they, they're, they've given up trying to land the one big plant that's going to employ 50,000 people. They try to create an atmosphere that supports entrepreneurs. They try to spruce up their downtown. They try to invest in schools. They get the mayor and the chamber and the, and the, school officials and the higher ed officials together to think strategically that seems you know which is sounds so simple but there's so many places where there are people you know in in overlapping jurisdictions where people in the city don't know what people in the county do mm -hmm. uh, who are working in the same field so uh, that's that's kind of a something you never think about but just knowing your peers within your area and getting to know them and seeing where you can work collaboratively, that ends up being a big deal. It is. I mean, we, we, we work as a political action committee and as, as you know, pro bono consultants with the libraries around the country, small places. Our smallest town was Potomac, Illinois, where there's 646 people. We've worked in, you know, in, in municipalities as big as Dallas and, and Miami and 
Santa Clara County, California, and across the country, we see uh, public libraries sometimes being a part of the government of last resort, or perhaps the last functioning part of government. And that's maybe because uh, that nobody's taken aim at them yet, but possibly because they're more aligned in, uh, across disciplines, across different parts of government. They might be the one part of, of government that actually knows between the town and the county, between you know, in town and out of town, um, who's doing what and how. And, and I look at the idea that the library as either a department of government or a special district might have some, might have a special role to play at this particular juncture, you know? And I'm wondering if, if, as you look at the way local government should operate, if you've got any tips for, for library leaders with those kinds of functioning towns in mind, the idea that building bridges, caucusing, having those kinds of conversations, are, are we potentially in a position when other parts of government aren't to bring folks together with the focus on economic well-being? Uh, well, you probably got the meeting space, right? So there's that. that yeah. um, um, so I was thinking about, I did a story a couple of years ago about um, uh, neighborhoods in Philadelphia that were not uh, attracting a lot of private investment. You know, most neighborhoods, even in boom cities, are not gentrifying. They're, it's usually a few zip codes and that's it. Uh, and then, you know, a city like Philadelphia has something like 20 percent of its residents in poverty, but that still leaves a lot of people in the middle. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are neighborhoods that are kind of teetering on the edge. They could go either way and nobody thinks about them because they don't attract private investment and they, they're not doing poorly enough to get a lot of government infusion. And so, you know, like I was saying at the local level, well then at the hyper local level, at the neighborhood level, banding together, banding together to work together is smart. And I went to a library in the Tackany neighborhood of Philadelphia, which is a, a home for, um, it's not an economic development agency per se, but it's a lot of economic development assistance. They have, they give the businesses in the neighborhood access to databases and other information, uh, tips on grant writing or navigating uh, tax tax codes, this kind of stuff to sort of technical assistance for businesses. And they've done pretty well and the businesses are, are doing better in that neighborhood as a result of the library being home to those functions. And I don't know, if I were running a library right now, I mean, certainly I would be afraid of budget cuts because those are bound to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'd also look at the political landscape and think, what kind of services, as we have this debate, at least in some places, over what should the police do? Do we need armed law enforcement personnel writing traffic tickets? Do we need them doing social work uh, type um, do, do they need to respond to every domestic situation? Um, you know, the, the police will tell you, it's not our fault. We didn't go looking for a land grab to do all these things. But when, you know, the social service agencies have been so cut, it has fallen to us. And same with prisons providing, you know, being the largest uh, mental health care provider in the country. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I guess I would think as a library, what are some things that we know we will want our city or county to keep doing despite budget cuts and can I get a piece of that? You mm -hmm. know, can I show some goodwill to the city council by saying, we are happy to house this function or what can we do to help facilitate and what can we do to help connect you with some of our nonprofit partners or whatever you've got going on? I mean, that, that to me would be the, you know, slightly like say entrepreneurial way of thinking about this. What are the opportunities for me to, um, to do something, obviously libraries do more than lend books. I don't want to character by saying do more, but you know, to think beyond even the mission of sharing information, providing information to patrons, how do I provide information to businesses that I'm not already reaching or to the community as a whole? You're speaking my language, Alan. I mean, I look at what the role of elected officials are in cities, towns, and counties. And even, um, you know, at the state and federal level, of course, but you know, where do we live? Um, you know, the, the agenda that elected officials have, generally speaking, is about interesting places to live, you know, and I see libraries helping support interesting through their programming, you know. I look at um, uh, the agenda that politicians and elected officials have around a thriving place to live, and some of that's literacy, I'll give you that, you know, but it's also just, you know, connections between people, health, transportation, livability, 
And I definitely look at elected officials and think that their primary role is around prosperity and a shared prosperity. And I think you're hitting the nail on the head when you describe how um, libraries either as you know, part of government within a, within a, a city department or town department um, or as special districts could be focusing on some of that prosperity, that shared prosperity. Um, I, I think that good libraries um, are in a very smart position when they look beyond just the, the information literacy or the language literacy and into that support for people's well-being. Yeah, well, think about the landscape that we're entering into where everyone is worried that Main Street is, sorry, Main Street is going to die off. Mm -hmm. You know, there are all these scare statistics of... Uh, just saw two thirds of restaurants in New York City are not gonna survive this. And yeah. I've seen other numbers elsewhere. So the restaurants are, are going, will the mom and pop businesses survive? Will everybody just shop on Amazon, et cetera? So if you have a place where you want it to feel like a place, your library is more likely than not in your downtown or across from your city hall or uh, part of your civic center in some way or another, what are activities that you can sponsor to bring people in? Can you have, you know, um, a porch front concerts? Do you have a big enough plaza or parking lot to have those now? Or what can you be thinking about, you know, after we get a vaccine, however many months that is, you know, that will happen. Uh, and, you know, a lot of, a lot of, there'll be a lot of vacant storefronts around you. So just bringing people to that part of town will mm -hmm. be a useful service. So, you know, a lot of people never visit a library you know they they just don't so how do you how do you get more community engagement with people who are you know not big readers um uh or just don't think or only think of the library as a place where you know their kid gets a picture book how do you get people to come um that'll that'll be fun and mm -hmm. that'll help rebuild your community and we, we look at the number of hours that a library is open as being a contributor because like we, we have cultural anchors we have educational anchors we have retail anchors. And I think the library functions across all three of those. If you're closed on a Saturday, there's a certain fewer number of footfalls that happen in that particular part of town. People leave their homes, they go shopping, they come to the library. They leave their homes, they go to the library, they go shopping. It's part of that fabric. So thanks for identifying that. It lines up with a lot of our experience as well. Well, the first thing you're gonna cut is your hours, right? I mean, if your yeah. library, your purchases and your hours. So. Um, maybe you need to rethink, like, you know, do you need to be open during the day as much as you need to be open at night for this period to come or things like that? You know, just think, think a little differently than the way yeah. you've always done it. Well, I'm with you on that. So as we're, we're coming around to uh, closing up this conversation, I, I, I enjoy your writing and governing a lot. I have a, um, an armchair um, economist's appreciation for what you're doing, and I have, I have a, a, a fellow... Uh, citizens need for good information about our government. I'm just wondering, as you're looking ahead today, again, it's the 8th of September, I'm looking at the calendar here. We're, we're two months out, you know, a little bit from the, from the election. I'm wondering what you're feeling like, uh, what you're seeing as we move towards that. I mean, there was a lot of primaries this year um, where incumbents lost. Now there's a, a fair number of incumbents who decided not to run. You know, what's it looking like in your estimation at that state and that local level, either in November or in the spring cycle? Are we going to see change coming up or are we going to see, where's it going? Well, the election that everybody cares about the most, of course, is the presidency. Mm -hmm. And if I were betting, I would bet on Biden to beat Trump at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, there's never been a race in the history of polling, which is basically the post-war period that has been as steady as this. Mm -hmm. uh, Biden's polling lead is 7%, you know, it was sort of 6% before the pandemic, it went to 8%, now it's down, settled seemingly at seven, you know, and people tend not to break toward the incumbent. And uh, if you look at the house races in 2018, where Democrats took back the house, they won by 7%, you know, Trump's numbers just don't change. Uh, he has a very solid floor, but he also seems to have a pretty solid ceiling. So, you know, we'll probably have a new president, I would guess. Um, you know, we all have 2016 PTSD, so you know, take that with a grain of salt, but Biden's lead is larger and steadier than Clinton's was. Mm -hmm. um, 
at the state and local level, well, at the local level, there's not much going on. Most most big cities do it in odd numbered years, uh, mayoral or county elections. There, you know, there doesn't appear to be a lot of changes coming um, at that level. And then at the state level, it's also pretty dull, to be honest. The most of the gubernatorial races happen in the midterm. Mm -hmm. There are only eleven races this year. There are, you know, very few competitive. It looked like North Carolina would be the marquee race, but the Democrat, Roy Cooper, is incumbent, seems to be in good shape there. Um, I'm in Missouri. Both both uh, parties are spending a lot of money, but this is a pretty red state at this point. So Mike Parson, who's the incumbent Republican, will probably be reelected. Uh, and then Montana will be an interesting race where the Democrats have actually had the governorship in Montana for 16 years. Steve Bullock was the governor term limit. He's running for Senate now. Um, I'd say I'd favor the Republicans there. So, you know, very little turnover. And then at the legislative level, we have, we've entered a period of stasis at the legislative level where very few districts are competitive. Um, you know, the Republicans control the legislature in every state that Trump carried. Uh, Democrats have every Clinton state, except Minnesota, where the uh, Senate wasn't up in 2018. They'll probably win that. They only need a couple of seats. Uh, but on average, the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the majorities are bigger than they were a decade ago. You know, even 10 or 10 and certainly 20 years ago, you could talk about, you know, you always had states like Maryland, in Hawaii, they were always Democratic, and Idaho and Utah were always Republican, but now almost every state is that way. It's very, there are very few states where there's any real competition at the legislative level. So the map we have now, you know, there'll be a few chambers that change, but, you know, historically a dozen chambers would change hands in an election. Mm -hmm. the last two elections, there's only been a half dozen, mm -hmm. and I'm surprised if we have that many this time. So they'll, they'll be pretty static. We really do have red states and blue states at, the, at this point. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of a long answer, but there's, you know, from where I sit, there's disappointingly little of interest happening in the state and local politics this year. Yeah, yeah, it's it's interesting given all of the um, social in issues that are happening, all the social movements that are happening, and there's not as much opportunity to vote, you know, given the, the, the timing for, for government. Last question for you, um, and this is just a uh, um, kind of a blue sky thing. We're, we're, if if Congress does make some some movement towards a, another relief bill, and I, I look at this, you know, you said earlier about it, you know, what to call it, you know, relief bill, stimulus bill, whatever. But I, I wonder about the infrastructure bills, and I'm wondering what your over under is on whether we're going to ever get off of our hands, you know, sit on our hands about infrastructure. Uh, President Trump ran on it. The Democrats run on it all the time. Do you see any possibilities of a, of an infrastructure bill truly moving? maybe as a component of stimulus, maybe as uh, a workforce initiative beyond, you know, the need to, to rebuild bridges and, and roads. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, during the Great Recession, infrastructure was seen as the way to go. You remember the phrase shovel-ready projects, that was a way to get people working and ways to spend money quickly and all those kinds of things, and you don't hear it at all now. No. What Congress is debating is relief for small businesses, relief for the unemployed, maybe rental assistance, maybe um, uh, state and local government assistance, but infrastructure, we've sort of lost our muscles on that nation. You know, I forget how many times the last infrastructure bill was so overdue, the federal infrastructure bill is supposed to be like every six years and it took them like an extra six years or something to do the last one. We haven't raised the federal gas tax since um, 1993. Mm -hmm. uh, and back then it had no Republican votes. Uh, so, so it's been a there's been a long time since there was will to raise a gas tax. Um, the the highway bill no longer pays for itself with federal gas gas tax revenues. They have to dip into the general treasury. Um, it's become kind of a standing. You know, there was time when Trump came in, like you say, he ran on it, and first he promised a trillion dollar infrastructure package and a trillion and a half, then two trillion, but nobody ever saw anything that you know resembled more than a. a bullet point uh, uh, kind of memo. Uh, and they, the White House would declare National Infrastructure Week repeatedly, and then they'd get off message and be talking about some other issue entirely. So it became kind of a joke, you know, among reporters, like, oh, it must be National Infrastructure Week since we're talking about immigration or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so 
Um, I certainly wouldn't expect anything this year. You know, I just free associate now, but I remember when, when, um, you know, when Trump took office, there was, and even for months after, there was talk about like infrastructure was a way he could make a deal with Chuck Schumer and mm -hmm. other Democrats. And what if he had done that first instead of tax cuts? Would, would, would he have set a different tone? Well, uh, that obviously didn't happen. So, you know, I would think under a Biden presidency, there's a pretty good chance, but under a Biden presidency, you know, who knows what will happen because Democrats, if they're lucky, will have 52 maybe Senate seats. Um, certainly not enough to break filibusters. Mm -hmm. Whether they decide to end the filibuster and just have two years where they can do what they want and risk that ending the filibuster, that, that'll be the big political question after the election, I think. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so no, I'm not optimistic of a major infrastructure package anytime soon. Um, and that we're, we're getting to be overdue for just reauthorizing the transportation law that we have. Right, some of the basics. Alan, thanks very much for, for sharing uh, your insights with us today. I, this has been an interesting, wide-ranging conversation. I, I wanted to ask across these different topics in order to help you know, our library leaders start to picture where they fit into it. Uh, I was hoping for a little bit more of a, uh, a ray of sunlight around infrastructure, because I think that there's ways to integrate you know, building initiatives and broadband and that kind of stuff. But I hear what you're saying, and I and I think you're probably right. You're not you're not paying me enough to do a motivational speech, so no, uh, no, I'm not here to bring good news. I mean, I just will go back to the underlying point, which is that uh, counties are expecting to fall 200 billion dollars short of their expected revenues this year. Next, cities 350 billion, states 500 billion. Many of the cuts at the state will be cuts to local governments. Um, their costs are going up even as, as their revenues have fallen you know, by huge percentages. So, you know, it's gonna be a rough couple of years, but uh, I guess to end on a more optimistic note, you know, after the Spanish flu, we had the roaring 20s after World War II, we had the post-war boom when we became the richest nation on earth. You know, even after the Black Death in Europe, life expectancy and standards of living went up. Uh, we will get through this pandemic in, and things will not only be good, but be improving. But it's it's going to take a take a while. We're we're the we're, we collectively hope we're about to turn a corner. We're not there yet, but it will happen at some point. So what you're saying is you you're promising me either the Renaissance, the Jazz Age, or rock and roll. I'll take all three. Yeah, there's going to be some good licks around yeah. 2023. Good to hear, ladies. Uh, everybody, thank you very much again, Alan Greenblatt, senior staff writer for Governing Magazine. Um, thank you, Alan. Be well. Thanks, you too.